is called No Enemies, No Hatred in Five Parts. Part One. You have been asked to represent the incarcerated Nobel Prize winning poet Liao Xiaobo at a prestigious international event in the East End of London. Your first reaction is a mixture of narcissism and hubris. You know for sure that you will write on your CV that you have collaborated with Nobel Prize winning poet Liao Xiaobo. In order to curry favour with the management of your academy, you'll be sure to inform your superiors of this event. You research Leo's life. You read about his 11 years in prison, his wife's three years of house arrest, and his brother-in-law's imprisonment under false charges. You read his book, No Enemies, no hatred, and his delicate, generous poetry. You read that he was one of four dissidents who helped avoid a massacre in Tiananmen Square. You read Charter 08, the document which demands a constitution for China and for which he is currently imprisoned. You read a letter which was smuggled out of prison in 2009. It says, the nimbus around me is shiny enough by now. Part two. You keep reading. In his essay, Iraq and the US presidential election, he states, so as to deal with trampling of human civilization and underline the extreme hazards of terrorism. The United States should not have any hesitation in the use of force. Further on in the text, Liu states, war against Saddam is justified. President Bush's decision is correct. Elsewhere, you read that Liu supports Israel's position against Palestine. The Palestinians, he states, unequivocally are the aggressors. You think of making a poem using only Liu's statements. You don't want to dumb things down so that your audience can feel good. You want Liu to speak for himself. And then you think of how it will look on YouTube with you standing at the mic, declaiming without context, the Palestinians are the aggressors. President Bush's decision is correct. And so you adopt another tack. You write a poem listing briefly all the notable genocides in history. By the time you are finished at 4 a.m., it is 40 pages long, and it is nevertheless an extremely superficial document. You end your piece with some words by the Buddha on peace. Yeah, that'll do, you think, and go to bed. Part of your poem states, Russian expansion into Siberia has been compared to the genocide practiced upon the First Nation people of North and South America. Among the murdered and forgotten Tungus, Yakut, Yukagir, Daur, indigenous peoples of the Amur region, Itulmen, Koraks, Chukchis, Aluits, Kamchadals, and Vogels, rates of genocide reached as high as 90%. Your poem states, at the end of the Second World War, 96% of the Jews of Lithuania and of Latvia had been murdered by the natives of the Baltic states. It states, between 1941 and 1953, 600,000 Lithuanians and Latvians were then deported to Siberian labor camps as part of the Russian policy of Sovietization. In Luxembourg and the Baltic countries, the Nazis killed virtually the entire Romani population. 
3.3 million Soviet citizens, mostly Ukrainians, were deliberately starved to death by their own government in Soviet Ukraine in 1932. The few Polish Jews who survived the Holocaust in southern Poland remembered those same Ukrainians as being the most vicious of all their oppressors. On the Australian continent, in a little over a hundred years, the British reduced the population of 750,000 Aborigine First Nation peoples to fewer than 50,000. Mounted police in Queensland alone killed more than 10,000 Aboriginals who were regarded as vermin and who were hunted for sport. You conclude, during the nine month long war which Pakistan waged against Bangladesh in 1971, an estimated three million Bangladeshis were killed and the Pakistani armed forces violated 400,000 Bangladeshi women and girls in an act of genocidal rape. The world is a dreadful place. Injustice, genocide and rape take place in every corner of the globe, under every type of political state. By writing this, your poem about genocide has successfully avoided the issue of Liu's questionable international politics, the media's glossing over of these statements, and his repeated advocacy of violence. And then you realize that that is the point. In a democracy, all views must be heard, whether you agree with them or not. Approximately 242,000 Iraqis have been killed by direct violence since the US invasion. The brazen and uncapturable multi-millionaire spiritual godfathers of Islamic State, Tony Blair and George Bush, are still at large and remain free to profit from their decisions. They will never be brought to justice. In an essay, Liu describes Bush as a courageous leader and compares him favorably to Winston Churchill. Since 1950 and China's occupation of Tibet, 1.2 million Tibetans have been killed and 6,000 monasteries destroyed. Tiananmen Square protests ended in murder, dissolution and disillusionment. The poet Jeremy Prynne has, allegedly, declared the murders protesters to be traitors to the true Maoist cause and to be capitalist lackeys. Liu spent most of the 1990s in Chinese re-education camps and he remains in prison. Free speech, like bad poetry, may be naive, stupid, bad or ill-informed. The moment it is silenced, the world is a far poorer place. In a letter to his wife, Liu wrote, Even if I am crushed into powder, I will embrace you with the ashes. Part 3 Having stated these points in advance of my poem, only now can I start. Part 4. The Buddha states, All beings tremble before violence. All fear death. All love life. See yourself in others. Then who can you hurt? Part 5. How should this poem end? The nimbus around us is shiny enough. The nimbus around us is not shiny enough. Thank you.